Okay, well, I'm going to start out with uh, verse 7. As ye also learn of Ephraim, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. You know, there's some people, they know how to love, but they don't know how to love in the Spirit. They don't know how to show it. It's meaning their action, actions. You know, a lot of people say, I love you, but there's no actions there. When you're doing it in the spirit, it, there's, there's an, there's, you see it. You don't just hear it. So there's a difference between saying it and showing it. When you do it in the spirit, you're showing it. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, it says that love in the spirit is joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Like love, biblically. Love is, is patient, it's kind, it doesn't demand its own way. Now this is a person who, who has love in the spirit. It doesn't demand its own way. It doesn't hold grudges. If you love, you don't hold grudges. It does not think evil of others. You don't think evil of others. Okay, this is what love is. Verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. And to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul saying, because of this new life you now live, we lift you up in prayer. He's saying, we're lifting you up in prayer. And he says, we also pray that you will grow in the knowledge of his will. That's what he's saying here. We need to grow in the knowledge of God's will. Not just in the knowledge of the word of God, what he, you know, what he's teaching us but right here he's saying we need to grow in the knowledge of God's will for us we need to pray and say Lord you know what's your will for me what why you know besides telling people about you what else do you have for me here okay we need to pray for knowledge of what God's will is for us because he, he's given everybody a gift some people have to give the praying they know how to pray they're prayer warriors some people he's given them the gift of of witnessing we're all supposed to be witnesses. We're all supposed to be that. But some of us are a little more bolder than others. Others. Why? Well, we use the spirit that's in us. That's why. Because when you use the spirit that's in you, you have boldness. How many of y'all know that the spirit is not ashamed? So if we are led by the spirit, we have no shame when we're witnessing the people. We do it with boldness. The Lord has given all, all of us the ministry of reconciliation. And I've taught on that before. And he also says he wants to give you wisdom in the spirit. In the spirit. Give you wisdom in the spirit. So that means he doesn't want it from man. You don't look at man's philosophies on what they think. Things are how you ought to do things or what you shouldn't do. How, what you should do. Which I'll get a little bit more on that later. But he says to, we need to have more wisdom in the spirit. In the spirit. You know, men have a lot of wisdom. But men who have a lot of wisdom that don't have the Lord, what does the Lord say about their wisdom? Foolish. It's foolish. So watch what wisdom. Right here it says wisdom in the spirit. Listen to the man who's telling you, who's giving you wisdom from here, from the Bible. Some of us take God's will. We take his will and we're like, we're, we're almost like little kids. He tells us something, what his will is for us on a certain matter or whatever but we're like little kids we're like I don't want to do that I'm serious we do that as Christians adults instead of praising God instead of praising him and rejoicing that he cares enough for us to show us what his will is how many of us know his will is better than ours amen he loves us to know he loves us enough to tell us what his will is for us so to, instead of us Oh man, come on, Lord! I, that, I don't want no, no. We need to stop that. We need to say, okay, Lord, that's what you want me to do. That's what I'm gonna do. Amen. Just give me the strength, and you got it. Give me the strength, and I'll do it. Verse ten: That ye may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. When you're walking in in His will, then you're worthy. You're worthy of pleasing Him. That's what this verse is saying. 
when you're walking in the Spirit, you're pleasing the Lord. You are worthy to Him. You are pleasing to Him. Our, one, our number one priority as a Christian should be to please the Lord. Should I live to please my wife? Is, is that what should be in my mind? Guess what? If I live to please the Lord, guess what's going to fall in place? I'll be pleasing my, my, my wife. Because if I'm looking to the Lord and pleasing Him, then that means I'm doing good things, right? And if I'm doing good things, then that my wife is going to get part of that too. So that should be pleasing to her. So should we look at people and, and, and say, oh, I want to I want to be pleasing to them? Or should we put all, all our priority in pleasing the Lord? Because if you please the Lord, then everything else is going to fall in place. The, the gifts of the Spirit, of love, you don't have to try to do these things. When you're walking with the Lord, it's just automatically going to happen when you're walking with the Lord. It's when you're not walking with the Lord that you have to grit your teeth to love everyone. Do you hear me? Then you're gritting your teeth and, okay, I'm supposed to love this person. No, that's doing it in the flesh. When you're walking in the Spirit, you really don't have a problem loving your enemies. And he says that you will be fruitful in all good works. The Word of God says it right here. Being fruitful in every good work. So whatever we do that's, that's of God, good works, it's going to be good. It's going to be fruitful. Amen? Amen? That's what he says. And he says, and, and in growing in the Word of God. That's, if we don't grow in the Word of God, all this that I'm saying right now, it's for nothing. We need to grow in the Word of God. Because before this... This teaching tonight, I'm sure there's some things in here you didn't know. But now you know. So now you've gotten a little more growth in your Christian walk with the Lord. Verse 11. Strengthen with all might according to His gracious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Christians are to be continually strengthened with, the all, with all power throughout their Christian life. We wake up every morning, every morning, ready, I was going to say, to fight temptation. What did the Lord say? He told us to stand. He said, stand, I'll do the fighting. So standing, which I uh, showed you before, standing is putting your eyes on Him. We don't have to go out there and fight it ourselves, fight against the devil. Because like I said before, in the book of James, I think it's chapter 5, the best way to fight the devil is to get closer to the Lord. So the Lord is saying, stand, just stand there. Put your eyes on me and stand there and I'll do all the fighting. And that's where our strength will be. That's how we have power, is by putting our eyes on the Lord. That's where we receive our power, by keeping our eyes on Him. And guess what? That power is limitless. There is nothing God cannot do. He has no limit on His power. Ephesians 3.16, it says that, he would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. So how do we get strengthened? By the Spirit. By the Spirit. Anybody who boasts and says, Oh, I'm a strong Christian, right there, right there, they're in the flesh. If you're a strong spirit, I mean, if you're strong, it's because of the Spirit, not because of, of, uh, of us. The first thing that's going to happen, if you're, if you're in the Spirit, you're not going to brag on yourself. Romans fifteen thirteen. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may be abound, abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. How many of us know how important, how important it is that we have the Holy Spirit? Have we realized that we are absolutely powerless without the Holy Spirit? They ain't nobody on this earth can stand up to the devil or his demons without the power of the Holy Spirit. Only Christians who are born again and have the Holy Spirit, we are the only ones who have the power against the devil. Y'all ever, ever thought about that? We have power against the devil and his demons. We have the power because the Lord has given it to us in the Holy Spirit. But people who are not born again, they can't lift one finger to the devil. The, the sticker that I've seen on cars, a real man loves Jesus, that's true. 
A real man, a real man fights Satan every day. That big tough guy, all muscled, all tough, if he's not born again, he can't lift a finger to the devil. You can take this wimpy looking Christian over here, wimpy looking, skinny and just wimpy looking. He's got more power to fight against the devil than this big strong man over here. So who's the real man? That little skinny puny guy over there. Why? Because he's got the power of the Holy Spirit in him. Real men love Jesus. I like that sticker. Paul also says that this knowledge was also required to have joy during trials and tribulations. Which I've read many scriptures about that before. Even though we go through our trials and tribulations, we should still be full of joy. Whatever this world's doing, whatever Obama's doing, whatever the Congress is doing, whatever this world is going through, it can go through a depression. It can. It can go through a depression. But what have I said at the very beginning of this teaching? We're not of this world. The world's going through a depression. Christians who follow the Lord, Christians who walk in the, in the Spirit, there's no depression for us. Because we don't belong in this world. Amen. Verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. So he says to give thanks to the Father. We should give thanks to the Father. And, and what he says to give him thanks for, he said to give him thanks for making us qualified to live with him in heaven. He made it possible for us to live with him in heaven. We should thank the Lord for that. For having the power to take away. We, we belong to the kingdom of the devil. Before we got born again, we were under the Satan's kingdom. We didn't know that. Oh, no, I don't live for the devil. Well, guess what? You was. Before you got born again, you didn't realize it, but you were. So you, we, have to, we have to thank him for taking us out of the devil's kingdom into his own kingdom. Amen? That's what happened. For bringing us back with the blood of Jesus and forgiving us for the way we were. I've said that a hundred times. It's God's grace that he even sent his son Jesus to give us forgiveness to give us a chance to have forgiveness. How many of y'all believe that, well, God had to send Jesus? How many of us believe that way? That he had to send Jesus? Uh -uh. Guess what? We have a righteous God. And if he wouldn't have sent Jesus, if he would have just wiped us out, he still would have been righteous. He still would have been righteous. Because what? We sinned. When I say we, we were Adam. We were Adam. And when Adam sinned, that is us. We sinned. Verse 15, who is in the image of the invisible God? Now, who's the who here? The who here in verse 15 is talking about what it says in verse 13. He's saying the who is his dear son. So he's talking about Jesus here. So you can say Jesus is the image of the invisible God because up here he's, he's talking about his dear son. Philippians 2, 6. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Talking about Jesus. Genesis one twenty six, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now God was talking to someone there. Who was he talking to? Because he said, He's talking to somebody because he said, Let us make man in our image. So who was he talking to? Who was God talking to? Trinity. Jesus, Holy Spirit, it was the Trinity. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You say, well, that, they're one. Yeah, they're one, but they're three. We have Jesus, man on earth, and we have the Holy Spirit that comes in us. They're the same, but you got God in heaven. You got Jesus who became man on earth, and you got the Holy Spirit who now lives in us. So when it says, let us make man in our image, people should, they, right there they should say, let us... Well, who's he talking to? Well, he's talking to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They say that Jesus isn't God because right here it says that Jesus was the firstborn of every creature. So they say Jesus is not God because God, he is the, 
He was the firstborn of every creature. God made Jesus in Exodus. Let's see about that. In Exodus 4.22. God called Israel. We're going to see that firstborn doesn't necessarily mean firstborn. That you were the first one born. In Exodus 4.22. God called Israel his firstborn son. He called Israel his firstborn son. Putting them first among all nations. But they were not the first nation. You understand what I'm saying? He said Israel was his firstborn son. Israel was not the first nation. There were other, other nations before Israel. But right here, he called Israel his firstborn son. So, firstborn doesn't necessarily mean that was the first one. You understand what I'm saying? In Psalms 20, uh, 89, 27, God says of the Messiah, He says, Also shall make him my firstborn, and then he then he defines what he means by saying the Messiah was going to be the firstborn. He says, the highest of the kings of the earth. Before Jesus came as a man, before he came, was there was there kings before that? Were there, was there kings before Jesus was born? Yes. So how could he be the firstborn king? So the firstborn doesn't necessarily mean firstborn. So I'm just trying to show you that. So there's a verse up here where it says, the firstborn of every creature... Well, he wasn't talking about he was the firstborn of all the creation. He wasn't talking about that. Verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. <coughs> so right here it says that Jesus... Right here, it's just saying it's saying it right here. Jesus created the heaven and the earth. That's what it's saying, right? For by who we're we talking about? Jesus, right? For by him, talking about Jesus, for by Jesus were all things created that was in heaven and earth. So who created heaven and earth? He's talking about Jesus. That's what we're talking about right here in this chapter. We're talking about Jesus. And right here it says Jesus created everything. Genesis one one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, how could God create the heavens and the earth? And then right here it says, Jesus created the heaven and the earth. Huh? Right? So Jesus got to be God. It says Jesus here. But Jesus, is, like I said, when we learn how to separate Jesus God and Jesus man, the scriptures will come a lot clearer to us. So God, Jesus God. God did create everything. It says that all things were created. Right there in the last part of that verse. All things were created by Him. The word were. That means everything's been created, everything. It doesn't say everything's being created. And the reason I point this out, because what do the evolutionists people say? People in evolution. They're saying things are still being created. That's what they say. But right here the Lord says... All things were created by Him. Meaning, all things have been made already. There's nothing new out there. So this just that one little verse right there puts evolution out. Because they believe things are still being created. That's why when we read the Bible, there's so much in it. That's why we, we got to read the verses over and over and over. Because the first time we read it, we might not catch that. We might not catch it the second time or the third time. But we might catch it the fourth time and... All of a sudden you see all things were created. Then you're like, were? That means they, everything has already been created. See how easy the Bible can put things that are not of God down? That's pretty simple right there, right? Just that one word puts down what the evolution would think. Verse 17. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. We're speaking about Jesus here. It says that He's before all things. It also says that he holds everything together. In verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminency. The firstborn from the dead. Was Jesus the only one? Was he the first one to raise from the dead? Now think, think about it. I didn't say resurrected. I said raised from the dead. There's a difference between raised from the dead and being resurrected. What happened to Lazarus? 
Lazarus was raised from the dead, but he was not resurrected. Resurrected means you get your new body. Lazarus was not resurrected. He was raised from the dead, but he still had his old body. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, you'll find when you read it, there's, there's people in the Old Testament and the New Testament, like Lazarus, that God raised from the dead. But who was the first one to raise from the dead a resurrection? Jesus. So he was the firstborn of the resurrection from the dead. Preeminency, meaning that he is superior. Jesus is superior. He's above all. In fact, he is God. Is there anything or anyone higher than God? No. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. Anybody out there who says, who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, what does it say? He's a liar. He's an antichrist. That's what it says. He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. You know, just, there's, there's many antichrists, but then there's going to be the antichrist, which is going to be the devil. But there's many antichrists, little antichrists. So that's what he's talking about here. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. So what is it saying here? People who don't believe that God came in the flesh. Where does that put the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because right here it says, Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. For Jesus to come in the flesh, that means he was in heaven in spirit. So what's that do with the Jehovah's Witnesses? They say that Jesus was just a man. But Jesus did come from heaven. And became man. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now already is in the world. Like I said before. Right now we do have Antichrists. Now I don't know if the, the Antichrist is here yet or not. My opinion. Just my opinion. Okay. Just my opinion. I think the Antichrist is already here. I think he is. Because I really believe the time is close. But, hey, they've been thinking that since, as soon as Jesus left, they've been thinking that. But sooner or later, it's going to happen, right? <laughs> sooner or later, it's going to happen. Second John, verse 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Y'all hear what these verses are saying? I don't even believe I have to explain them. It's pretty clear right here. And if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, if they're not preaching this gospel that we have right here, the Bible, he says if, if they don't bring this doctrine to you, it says receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. Don't let him in the house. And when they're walking off, don't say God bless you. Because that's what it means. A lot of people do that just because the people seem to be religious. And the only way we can tell between cults and Christianity is how? Reading the Word of God. Because if you don't read this, how can you tell? You can't tell. <coughs> Verse 11, For he that abideth in, in God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. That's what it says right there. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of of his evil deeds. So people, if you're not sure about them, and mainly I'm addressing the, the, the head of the house, if you're home, that's your responsibility to go see who's at that door, and your, your responsibility to see who is this. And right off the bat, if you know, okay, well, I know this religion is not there, don't let them in. And if you're not sure, then talk to them at the door. Talk to them at the door, don't let them in. And if they, if they believe that Jesus is God, they believe in the Trinity, 
they believe you have to be born again, then hey, it sounds like these are brothers. Then you let them in. It's your responsibility to be at the door. Wives, you don't let them at the door, period. Especially it's mainly guys that come around preaching anyway. You don't ever let a guy into your house without your husband home, ever. Preachers or teachers, they don't go and witness to women alone. It doesn't look good, and who knows? The devil might use that woman just to have a false, he raped me, just to get, just to bring that man of God down. You understand what I'm saying? So we don't even go into a woman's house unless our wife is with us. So women, do not open the door to, to strange men. And even men, even if you do know them, just talk to them at the door. It doesn't look right. Okay, the Bible says we need to watch how we we need to watch how we act and what we do in front of people, because already they they want to bring lies about us, because they don't like the way we're living. They're jealous because we have something that they don't have. They can have it, but they don't want it. But yet they're jealous. You hear what I'm saying? Verse twenty. And having made peace through the blood of the of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in, in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked words, yet now hath he reconciled. There is only one way to have peace in this world, and that's through the blood of Jesus, right? There's only one way, and it says it right here, through the blood of Jesus at the cross. We were lost and wicked. Now, I've already said that before. Before we became Christians, believe it or not, I don't care if you if you thought you was a good person. If you didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, you were wicked. I don't care if you gave your shirt off the back to help people. I don't care if you took your last penny to help people. If you didn't have the Lord Jesus Christ, you were wicked. But because of God's grace and His love, He lets us pray to Him. And He shows us how to live. Until we go to be with Him, either... When we leave this earth or when God comes and gets us, until then, it's only because of God's grace that He even allows us to worship Him. Not because we deserve it. Remember that. We do not deserve it. Praise God, He didn't give us what we deserve. But now it says that now He's brought us back. The word is now. Not that He's working on it, because it says, Yet now, now hath He reconciled you. Now. In verse 22. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. This is the way the Lord wants to present us. This is the way we need to go before our God. Blameless. Blameless. Not sinless. Okay. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship. He's working on us. He'll work on us until that day comes. He's going to be molding us. Like I said, we're the clay. And he's going he's gonna to be molding us until that day comes. It says, for, he, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in. We need to walk with the Lord. We need, when you walk with the Lord, you'll have good works. Not that good work saves you, but once you're saved, this is what happens. You'll have good works. Verse 23. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am a minister. What have we been talking about? The church. And we're talking about, he's been talking about other gospels. People with a different gospel. Right? That's what we've been talking about. So what he's saying, don't leave what you've already learned. Don't leave what you've already learned. And I think I've told you all before, I know a lady, she was supposed to be born again Baptist, but then she left the Baptist church and went to Jehovah's Witness. She left the Christian church and went to a cult. And what it says right here, it says don't leave what you, what you first learned here in the Bible. Don't leave that. We have to stay with Him. I've seen, I've seen religious people do that. I mean... I, Apparently, this woman was not born again from the beginning. Because you got the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will re reveal to you a cult. If you allow the Spirit to do that. But if you go in there with closed eyes and, and you're just going to believe whatever that man says, 
then your faith is in that man, then you're stuck. But if you allow the Spirit to show you, the Spirit will show you. But we have to allow the Spirit to show us. I, I myself, I've never seen a born again, someone who I know is a born again Christian, I've never seen them leave the truth and go out to a cult. Like I said, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, the Holy Spirit will show you. If you allow them. And right here it says, why? The reason they don't go to other cults is because they're grounded and settled. They're grounded and settled in what they believe. That's the way we need to be. Just like my brother-in-law, he's Jehovah's Witness. He's, he's grounded in what he believes. He, he's grounded in that. But I'm, in, I'm grounded in this. I'm grounded in the Word of God. And he's not moving me. And from what it looks like, I'm not going to move him either. Where your faith is, that's where you're going to be grounded. His faith is in something else. But he's grounded there. And the only way he's going to be uh, uh, reached is by being drawn by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has worked on him, is working on him. He might not ever come around. Verse 24. Who now rejoice in my suffering for you, and fill up that which is behind of the affliction of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul was in prison when he wrote this book. Paul was in prison several times for preaching the gospel. And right here he was in prison when he wrote this book. In Philemon, verse 9, it says, Yet for love's sake, I'd rather beseech thee, being such one as Paul the age, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That sounds like, man... We're prisoners of Jesus Christ? Not in the way that the world looks at prisoners. Okay? Paul is saying, I have surrendered myself to the Lord. I have given the Lord my life. I have a life sentence with God. That's what Paul is saying. Not like the prisoners that we think of today. Now, that's not the kind of prisoner he's talking about. When he says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ, he's saying, I have surrendered myself. I have given my life to the Lord. I have a life sentence with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Can we say that? Can we say that? I hope so. Apostles at this time considered it a privilege. At this time, when they were killing Christians, they considered it a privilege to suffer for Christ. They considered it a privilege and honor. And that's what the same thing with us. Lord, if I have to suffer, whatever it is, because I'm a believer... Praise God. Instead of doing it the other way and start crying because you're having to go through something. What did Philip do? I mean, uh, Stevens. When he was being stoned to death, what did he do? He was praising the Lord. Was he crying and saying, Oh, me, oh, us? No. He was praising God. Amen? Acts 5.41 And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Paul says he counts it a joy to suffer, to suffer for the Lord, the church.